So I won a songwriting contest. I think luck is a huge factor in why people succeed. I just figured, oh, I'm just gonna find another record deal. And then tick, 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 no new record deal. I went and sang with David Bowie, I got that job. So talk about the ultimate distraction. So after you graduated, you then left. Did you go to Montreal or Toronto? Where did you go after Fanshawe? I actually went to Toronto, yeah. Right. Yeah. And what did you do there to further your... Because a starving musician is very difficult, especially after you've just graduated. Mm -hmm. You were at a lucky point, I perhaps, in the music industry where people were still... There, we had it was before streaming and mm -hmm. all that kind of. There were still record companies, mm -hmm. so just give us a, a recap of the path that got you your first deal and and the Juno nominations and uh, that kind of thing. So yeah. when you went to Toronto, I love that you said that. That you know it was a lucky period because I think maybe 15 years ago I would have taken some offense to that, like oh I worked so hard to get here, you know. But I think luck is a huge factor in why people succeed. And I did get in right at right before the whole music industry changed. Um, so I won a songwriting contest while I was in Toronto. I was playing clubs. I entered this contest. I won it. And then with that money, it was $5,000, I made an album. And with that album, I hired a publicist who spread the word about this little indie album I made, and it got all the way to a producer in New York named Warren Brule, who worked with the Violent Femmes. And he passed it on to this woman in LA, and within, well, it sounds like it was very fast. It was really maybe three or four years um, before I signed, well, not that long, maybe two years before I signed my first record deal. Um, and it was a worldwide deal. It was signed out of New York. And um, I kind of felt like, you know, haha, -ha, you Canadian labels <laughs> that didn't want to sign me. Look what I got, you know. But then within a year, I was dropped. Because so they were bought out by Warner or Universal or? Uh, Seagram's took over Polygram. Right. That's what it was. It was a, and they only decided to focus on their core business or they dropped artists they didn't feel were yep. part of their core business strategy. That must have been devastating because here you were on top of the world with this worldwide deal. What mm -hmm. what did that... I read your book and it, there's more ups and downs in your <laughs> life. That have, How could you pack all these adventures into 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 your life so far? But tell me, uh, we'll get all of that in, in a minute, but tell me what happened. Were you devastated when that news broke? I really wasn't the type of person to like admit that I was devastated if I was um plus there was still a lot going on like summer long which was my single from that album did come out up here and was like a radio hit so I was sort of riding that wave um and then I just <coughs> figured you know when you're 21 you just kind of think well nothing nothing bad is really gonna happen even if it does happen it's not that bad <laughs> um so I just figured oh I'm just gonna find another record deal and then tick 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 no new record deal and then people are like oh like this is the whole tide was turning with um the internet by then and yeah so life just moved on I went and sang with David Bowie I got that job so talk about the ultimate distraction from you know what should have maybe been devastating. So tell me the timing of that and how you actually, uh, it seems like a remarkable um, a change in your life to be picked up by David Bowie, who was at the top of his game. How did that come about? I had been playing shows in New York, and my manager at the time, a, an Irish guy named Michael Murphy, he took on another artist named Holly Palmer, and she had already joined David Bowie's band as a backing vocalist, but they needed one other person. So I did a show with Holly and she was like, yeah, you know, they're looking for another person. And if you want to me to put your name in, I will. And I didn't really know all that much about Bowie, sadly. <laughs> like I knew about Let's Dance. I knew about, you know, China Girl and that sort of thing. But I didn't really know about all of his legacy. Right. So I was like, yeah, sure. Let's do it you know I don't have a record label and 
sounds like a good paycheck and David Bowie and I mean I I know kind of who he is <laughs> so yeah I was learning his songs I learned them very very uh, intensively and then I just showed up for rehearsal and there he was and off to the races and then a week later we were doing Saturday Night Live and you were also on keyboards or did that come later the keyboards came later yeah, yeah. they needed an extra person to like I guess it was like triggering horns and let's dance and little pads and ashes to ashes and things like that. Mike Garson, who played on Aladdin Sane, was the actual keyboard player. So he was, I was just kind of filling in, but it was great. Like, you know, all of those piano lessons, like finally doing something with them, right? So you had a week to rehearse and then you were on Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. That must have been quite pinching yourself. Am am I really here? What was the feeling that you, you went through at the time? really surreal because Saturday Night Live was something I you know in that secluded place uh, growing up I watched it all the time so it was great to you know see how they um, put the show together yeah Yeah. and I mean you're no stranger to putting you know TV and film and things like that together but to me I was just like wow they do the show once and then you got to do it again like I was just exhausted by the end of it and then they have an after party after and it was just it was really fun it looks more glamorous on TV when you watch it and it's really a lot of uh, industrial magic I guess putting it together in the yeah. in the show I was really surprised by that so tell me everybody uh, we're not going to dwell on this episode about only about David Bowie but I do want to get into the uh, other stuff that you're doing but so tell me who David Bowie was off stage because we all know him as this uh, artist who uh, chameleon who does these many different things he was very different in, in his real life tell me a little bit about what you got to learn about him as a person as opposed to a performer well David was at a very happy stage in his life I think when I joined the band he was um, about to have a baby with Iman and doing a lot of his older stuff again I think there was a period where he went through the bit of the techno stage and was experimenting with that and when I landed in the band it was sort of like oh let's just play the songs let's just play Starman and Ziggy Stardust and (coughs) you know all these his catalog his his library of music yeah yeah. um and i think what i learned was uh you know he had been through more than i knew about you know but he would always take the time to really explain things to me and there really wasn't a hierarchy of people in the band um he treated people fairly and he was also very curious about music and i felt you know I could do this for a long time, you know, because it was tw- I was 24 at the time when I was in his band turning 25. And I felt like, you know what? I could be 50 and do this, right? I Many people be, do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think he brought a lot of fun to it and he did not cater to like what people wanted. Um, he really was led by his own curiosity. And there's a big danger in that industry. You can get caught up in the ego and the dangerous elements of mm-hmm. being a superstar. Do you think he remained it and you remained it grounded in that whole experience? Or? Yeah, it was incredibly <laughs> comfortable. You know, like I think everyone was kind of on eggshells sometimes around him because he's David Bowie, right? But as, like I've been around a lot of famous people and he just, it was about the work, Yeah. right? It was about, you know, he really was jazzed about, like, the music and the work. Um, Less so about, I mean, he was really excited about the internet because it had just sort of come out. He was really excited by the possibilities of that. More so than, you know, selling a zillion records. I think actually he said to me one time that he wanted to make music so uncommercial that he had no audience left. (laughs) (laughs) And whether he meant it or not, you know, I don't know. But, like, that was kind of his vibe. ¶¶ 